Hello. <laughs> I'm President Eduardo Ochoa, and this is our President Speaker Series. I would like to welcome all of you to the first event of this year. Throughout this academic year, we will be taking a broad look at issues that affect all of us on the Central Coast. I would like to thank Bud and Rebecca Colligan for their contribution, which is helping support this year's series. Cal State Monterey Bay's three-county service area of Santa Cruz, San Benito, and Monterey counties is energized by its ethnic and social diversity. At the same time, our region faces the same widening economic disparities that characterize our nation and our world. However, for all their diversity in background and economic status, the residents of our region face common challenges. Today, we have assembled an outstanding panel to discuss one such challenge, affordable housing. On the Central Coast, a vast majority of wage earners cannot afford a median price home. The impact of that fact is felt throughout our society and our economy. When any of us commute to work on Highway 68 or Highway 1 or Highway 17, we deal with the consequences of large numbers of people who simply cannot afford to live close to their jobs. When our businesses seek to attract good employees, they must deal with the barrier of unaffordable housing. Wasted time, wasted gasoline, disrupted lives, lost opportunities, all are part of the social and economic costs of a dysfunctional housing market. Recently, as part of our Bright Futures Cradle to Career educational initiative, our data team has been compiling statistics on trends around our region. When it comes to jobs, the team has found that while there is a market for college-educated workers, and it will grow in the future, the highest demand right now is for lower-wage employees in areas such as hospitality and agriculture. And those, of course, are precisely the workers who cannot afford, afford to find uh, an affordable place to live on the Central Coast. It is a complex issue, and we're joined by three people today who will help us look at its many aspects. Let me first introduce Carol Galanti. Carol. <laughs> Carol is the I. Donald Turner Distinguished Professor in Affordable Housing and Urban Policy at UC Berkeley. A Berkeley graduate, she returned to the Bay Area last year after serving as Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and a Federal Housing Administration Commissioner. Next, let me introduce Jennifer Lassar. <laughs> Jennifer Lassar is president and CEO of Lassar Development Consultants, has more than 25 years of experience in the real estate development and banking industries, and is a board member of the San Diego Foundation. She has been active in a number of groups addressing issues of homelessness, affordable housing, and sustainable development. And finally, let me introduce Owen Lawler. Owen. <laughs> Owen brings us grassroots expertise on how these issues are playing out in our area. He is a principal in Lawler Land Use and Consulting, a land use entitlement and real estate development firm in Santa Cruz. He is a member of the Urban Land Use Initiative and National Association of Home Builders. Um, I would like to remind you that during the discussion, if you have questions for our guests, please fill out the cards that are available and hand them to the staff members who will be circulating through the audience. Let me start by making a, a few sort of uh, introductory framing remarks uh, for, our for the presentation by our panelists. As you know, uh, CSUMB was created when Four Door closed. Uh, at which point uh, our region lost one-third of its economic base. Uh, CSUMB's growth has been a success story in the four-door reuse plan, but we are only partially offsetting that loss. The scale of the base was considerably larger than the university. So we are still faced with the challenge of how to strengthen and recover the economic base of this region uh, in the best way for the future. Uh, if you read the four-door reuse plan, which you might have trouble doing because it's not available online, uh, we're going to try to address that, by the way, um, you'll find that uh, the plan envisioned a balanced approach between the environment, education, and the economy. Um, and in discussing the issue of housing, uh, it kind of uh, posed the, the, the quandary but didn't solve it 
of whether housing leads or leads growth or follows growth. Uh, which comes first, the jobs or the housing? Um, so, uh, it in, so that's a question that we're going to have to grapple with. The other one is, uh, as we grow the regional economy, should we be diversifying our economy or simply doubling down on our existing industries, hospitality and agriculture? Um, we, have, we have also had uh, conflicting views about how much emphasis to put on environmental concerns versus economic growth. Uh, we have problems of water that have been aggravated by our current drought and we certainly have transportation challenges in the region. Um, our own uh, growth as a university, if we, uh, if, we ever, uh, if we ever contemplate going beyond 12 to 15,000 students, which is our current sort of planning scenario, we're gonna run into those, those issues, issues of water and transportation infrastructure. Then there's the question of the schools. In fact, you really have a circle that can be virtuous or vicious, and it involves uh, jobs and housing, education, skilled labor, new business formation, which then generates jobs, housing, et cetera. And so it's a cycle, and the question is how to break into that cycle and direct the growth uh, into a, a, a positive pattern. On top of that, we have the, the problem that uh, development decisions are being made by uh, individual municipalities, based on their own pressing uh, tax base needs. But those decisions made at the local level have regional impact and have long lasting consequences for the direction of the regional economy. So uh, those are some of the challenges. And, we, and obviously what we need as we move forward is a housing mix that mirrors the profile of our workforce and minimizes commuting time uh, and, and transportation costs. So how do we solve this puzzle? Well, they're going to tell us all about it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to start. Uh, we're going to bring up uh, Owen, who's going to uh, set the stage by focusing on the, the local region. And then we'll move from there. Owen. Well, thank you, President Cho, and thank you for inviting me here today. Um, and uh, thank you, Andre, for a great tour we had this afternoon. It gave me a really a more insight into what a great opportunity is here on the campus here. And those of you who are here know it's, it's, it's a tremendous opportunity and, tr and a very interesting opportunity. And I, I, when I thought about make do, uh, speaking today, I thought about it might be useful. And in some ways, I've been working in Santa Cruz County uh, most of my career, and I've seen an evolution, and there's some similarities and some big differences, but it's an interesting, at least, point of discussion. So I thought it would be interesting to talk, when we talk about a housing crisis, how did we get to where we are today, where there's this incredible gap between what's affordable and what the, the marketplace produces and, and, the, and the lack of affordable housing, and this region is always ends up on the list of some of the least affordable places in the United States in terms of, the, and that, for those of you, it means the delta between what people's average wages are and what the average homes sell for. So um, if we could go to the first slide. So in Santa Cruz, it's an interesting, to me interesting at least, to study what, how we got uh, from the late 70s to where we are today. So at that time, there was a big movement to reduce there was a concern that the com community was growing too quickly, and there was a lot of folks who wanted to see uh, that growth uh, slowed or curtailed or uh, minimized. And so there was, a, there was a county measure called Measure J that was adopted in 1978. And that's interesting, but it's really, in a sense, misses the point. What also happened in that time is that it, the general plan of the county was changed in a way that reduced really in a, significantly the uh, amount of land that was really available for development within the urban parts of the county. And, and you can see that, and this is what, I, when I did this research, I actually was surprised to see this. So from 79 to 89, there was an average of almost 700 permits a year in Santa Cruz County. That dropped from nine, 1990 to 93 to only 217 permits a year. And then from 2014, 
2004 to 2014, it dropped to 131 permits. And when you think about the housing cycles we've been through in that period, that's a significant reduction in housing production. And, and, and so, in a sense, it's not really a surprise that what's left is very expensive. We haven't, been, we haven't really been, been, been uh, building enough to meet even the kind of the, the pent-up demand for housing. So part of that was, a, I think, a, well, well, a good idea to make a, a kind of a strict urban limit line around the urban parts of the county. But what was kind of lacking in this discussion was a kind of a ro robust infill strategy that said, OK, if we're going to limit the, the, the housing opportunities outside of the urban limit line, how do we create an, an inventory of lands within the urban limit line that's zoned and ready to go for development. And that was not politically popular, so it just didn't happen for a whole variety of reasons. And we can go to the next slide. So part of that reality Santa Cruz and Monterey face is that we have a limited number of multifamily developments. Most of the houses that got built were single-family dwellings. And I was surprised to learn when I did that 83% of Santa Cruz County homes are single-family dwellings. And it's a rural county, and I understand that, but as time has, has gone on, the urban parts of the county are probably ripe for some more infill development that's denser, that's going to be more affordable. I think that's something that would be important to explore as, as time goes on. So the consequences of reduced amount of housing is that especially people with the lower incomes end up with very difficult housing choices or limited housing choices. And um, in Santa Cruz County, 10% of all, all renters use Section 8 vouchers, but 27% of the renters would be eligible if they were available. So that gives you just an insight of how deep this problem really is. Um, and then another important part of this, which affects all of this, is the, that the number of um, houses that were the age of the housing stock, which is a huge kind of in indicator of the quality of housing. So not only are you paying a lot for housing, you're getting poor quality housing. And so without a, new, without a robust rebuilding of housing stock, a lot of the housing stock in both counties is quite aged. So. Um, that just creates another set of hurdles to, to really create you know, great housing opportunities. So um, we can go to the next slide. So, so what happened during this period is that there was, during the period of the redevelopment agencies, there was a fair amount of housing that was, as a percentage of the total stock that was built, that was actually um, subsidized housing that provided long-term affordable housing, which is great, but because the total development was so small, it really didn't move the needle in terms of affordability um, at all. I mean, back to the previous slide, where if the total housing stock that was produced was so small, even though a lot of what was produced was highly affordable, the total production was so low that it really didn't impact affordability much, especially when we have the upturning cycles like we have now. And then I think an important point to, to raise in, in this discussion um, is that the production of market rate housing is, is important when we have these cycles that allow the production of, 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 because when people are competing in the marketplace for housing, it's important that uh, higher income folks have an opportunity, uh, aren't in the same competitive pool with lower income folks. And that's why it's become, um, you know, it's a problem in that we don't produce enough market rate housing. I think a lot of people, I think, feel like, well, if we, if we produce more affordable housing, we could solve the problem. Well, I think a robust housing market requires both the production of affordable and market rate housing to really uh, have any hope of kind of driving, bending the curve on affordability. Um, and you know, uh, to uh, President Ochoa's point, I do believe, and I think that the, the 40 years in Santa Cruz has shown that it's difficult to recruit jobs, higher paying jobs, without good housing options. I do believe that housing is the first part of that 
virtuous cycle because employers look to the, the, the challenges that em their employees face in coming to a new market. If, if you've got great, better housing options, ho employers are more likely to consider the op opportunity. To move. Santa Cruz has had a difficult time recruiting um, uh, em uh, larger employers with higher paying jobs, partly because of a, of a very limited stock of housing options. And, um, and it leads to more out commuting, significantly more out commuting. So what do we do now? How do we move on from here? I think uh, there needs to be a greater public awareness of what the consequences of a constrained housing supply are to, to the health of a community. And I think if we can begin that discussion in a way that people don't feel as threatened by new infill development, I know how difficult that is, but I think it's, we've got to begin that discussion. Um, and, and, to, and, and ultimately, we need to increase the amount of, in, of zoned infill lands. It has to, you know, you know we, we, we really don't have an option at the end of the I mean, if we want a, full, a healthy, diverse communities, that's the direction we need to go. Um, and find ways to reduce those costs where possible. And um, there really is no, no substitute for more supply when there's in a hot, and there are consequences to constraining that supply. And I think, in a certain way, the history here is, a, is kind of a case study in what happens when you do, you know, constrain that supply. And, and, and recently, the LA uh, the Legislative Analyst Office did a report on Coastal California and projected that Cal Coastal California is going to need to build a, to just begin to satisfy the demand, 140,000 units in the coast of California. So. Um, with that, uh, you know, and if we do nothing, you can go to the next slide, we're going to have more of the same. So with that, I'll turn it over to my learned colleagues to talk more broadly about some housing issues facing the state and the nation. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Jennifer Lassar, and I uh, live in San Diego, but I have the privilege of working across the state, um, and I'm really uh, grateful to be invited here today. I just want to say that Andre Lewis told us that usually the audience is about two-thirds community members and about one-third students, but today it's reversed, and it's about two-thirds students. So I'm going to guess that all the students are here because you're worried about where you're going to live when you graduate from uh, college. Um, So uh, I want to start by thanking uh, President Ochoa uh, for having us here. It's really a, an honor to be invited and to join the president, the CSU Monterey Bay and Tri-County Communities, our other panelists um, at the discussion here today on the housing affordability crisis. And I want to recognize that this convening is emblematic of the president's ongoing commitment to positioning the university to be responsive to the region's needs and to have a curriculum that's preparing the students to understand the Central Coast communities and to further the region's well-being. And I want to applaud President Ochoa, your leadership in developing the university's role in regional and economic development. It's in this spirit that we're here today to talk about the region's workforce housing affordability crisis. As a major economic driver in the region, the university has su substantial power to address and move the needle on pressing regional economic issues through its ability to be a neutral convener and to inform regional stakeholders and to bring intellectual capital to problem solving and to support local leadership in moving to action. I want to start uh, just by assuming that not everybody knows what housing affordability and affordable housing are. So when we talk about affordable housing in the United States, we talk about housing generally that is for um, households under about 60% of the area median income. Um, but we're also really talking here today about housing affordability in general, and I want you to know that housing affordability, how much we all have to spend on our housing, regardless of our income, has actually become a global crisis, a California crisis, and certainly a crisis in this region. 
So except for the very rich, all of us are facing um, huge housing expenses. And not only housing, but housing, transportation, and utilities combined today are starting to consume upwards of 50 to 75 percent of the, of the income of families. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about our work in San Diego, uh, and that's the basis of my, my um, conversation with you here today. Uh, and I'm going to give you the framework for that, and then in the question and answers, I'm going to talk about solutions. So in San Diego, we were asked to um, address the issues of how to drive housing production and how to reduce costs, not only for affordable housing, but for housing in general, especially multifamily housing, so rentals and condos. Um, we were tasked with creating an action plan that our federal, state, and local legislators and agency executives could use um, to increase housing production and to reduce costs. We're about 90% complete, and we've boiled it down to 10 to 12 very specific actions that they can take. I'm sure all of you know that many, many reports sit on shelves, and we were, we were um, determined to find something that our legislators could literally pick up, go to their, their dais, and, and, and bring forth legislation. Our work is grounded in extensive research, including aggregating the thought leadership from leading global, national, state, and local think tanks, foundations, universities, and trade associations, all work written in the last two or three years. And we have a diverse set of readers helping us to refine our work, including economists, developers, policymakers, and academics, and including Carol, our speaker here today, who covers about three of those categories. Um, the work's intended as a plug-and-play product. I think all of you probably know what that is, but something where you can take out one part, put in another part, and play it again. Um, and so, it, again, it's embedded in, in global, national, and, and statewide thought, uh, but the San Diego portion is meant to take it out and pop in your own data and have it be a framework that can be used throughout California. So it's a very California-centric product, but not a San Diego product. It's, it's a product meant for local local communities to take action. So I'm going to walk you through that framework. Uh, and again, in the question and answers, I'll talk to you about our very specific recommendations that we um, made. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, at, the, at the risk of embarrassing myself in front of your president, who's actually an economist, and I'm not, I'm going to talk about housing market fundamentals. Uh, I'm going to talk briefly about three things, what the, the concept of composition of our housing stock, how the housing stock needs to ha be, have the ability to grow, and then what's, what's been happening with recent economic trends. Um, so, so, okay, I'm a little lost in my, okay, I got it. Um, um, so what we want in, a, in an ideal housing market is that the stock matches our needs. Uh, where we are in our own lives and, and in the lives and, and, the, and, the, um, and the composition of our community. So matter, no matter where we are, we want to be able to find something that's the right size, the right quality, in the right place with access to services, amenities, and jobs at the right pr price and for the right duration. So it might be short term, it might be long term, we might want to be homeowners. So I'll give you a couple examples. Please go back. Um, um, I will do this myself. Thank you. Um, so for a student, and we're going to go to Santa Cruz for the summer, what we hope to find, because uh, we're going to be a seasonal worker, is something that's inexpensive and clean, located close to a job, probably within biking distance, and not too expensive. If we're a seasonal agricultural worker, we want the same thing, something that can get me to the harvest season, that I can get there quickly without too much cost, uh, and I will be safe and it will be clean while I'm there. If we're raising our families and communities, we want the opportunity to rent and then buy housing that is uh, of reasonable quality and good locations that we can afford. Um, so that's really what a balanced market is. It's, it's always having those, those characteristics no matter who we are. And we want our, market, our housing market to be able to grow um, with our population. So in California, we have population growth of about 1% a year. Um, we're approaching 40 million people in the states. We're growing at about 300,000 uh, people a year. That's actually a lot of, of, of bodies to put in houses. We want the housing market to change as, ho as household formation changes, and we want it to match and be able to respond to the need of evolving economies. 
no better example than a shifting housing market sitting here uh, on Fort Ord, where we had tremendous change in the economy, loss, and rebuilding, and a shifting of different types of people now in the community. Um, so, what's, so, so what's caused us to have such an affordable housing crisis or housing affordability crisis in California? Uh, I want to talk first about supply. As everybody knows, we went through a horrible recession from 2007 to 2009, and as a result, uh, we had very little housing production, so that, that production did not keep up with our population growth. In addition, and as Owen talked about Measure J from Santa Cruz, which was 30 years ago or more, uh, we have a long history in California of, of community inhibitors to growth. So we have a long history of anti-growth, of, of nimbyism in this coastal um, California market. So what's nimbyism? Not in my backyard. I don't want any low-income housing. I don't want any density. I don't want any high rises. I don't want any more traffic. I don't want anybody else to use my water. Long, long history. Um, and now, as a result of, the, of just more population growth, the, the market economics are such that we can barely build moderate income housing. Uh, we haven't been able to build low income housing for, for decades and decades. That's always required subsidy, but we have been able to provide housing for our lower income workforce, and even that is changing. And making that worse is that we have a loss of federal subsidies and a loss of state subsidies. Um, and so what is the, the impact of that? Well, if you look at the bar chart um, on the left, California cities are among the 10 most affordable, unaffordable cities in the country. Two of those right here in Northern California with San Jose and San Francisco, and then Los Angeles and San Diego um, as well. Um, the scatter diagram that you see uh, it is actually a really great uh, sort of pictograph. What it shows is the percentage of income that people spend on rent. Um, and so if you look at the green dots, that percentage of income up, up the up access is plotted over a number of building permits per thousand residents per year. So what we see in California is we're approving about 200 to 400 building permits per thousand. Um, so very little building uh, in relationship to growth, and, and as a result, we're paying 40 to 50 percent of our incomes in rent. What we see on the blue is much of the Midwest is uh, approving a lot more building permits. They're building at a steadier rate, and as a result, their populations are paying 25 to 30 percent of their incomes in rent. That's actually the level of rent we're supposed to be paying. Um, so that's the, that's the supply side, very constrained here in California. And so let's look at the demand side. Uh, what happened when the economy improved, finally, in the last few years, I think, when we feel it, is that we have very low vacancy rates because we had population growth with no, with no building. Uh, and as a result, that drove up rents and it drove up purchase prices. In addition, uh, millennials began to leave their parents' homes, finally. Uh, my 30-year-old nephew, for the first time in his life, is financially independent this year. Um, and uh, as a parent aunt, I'm very grateful. Uh, and as the millennials left home, they also began to form families and feel like they finally were going to have the means to have children. Um, so we have, you know, millennials leaving, new households forming, and, and actually we're probably going to have more population growth in the short term to make up for that pent-up demand in baby production. Um, so how did the California economy fit into all of this? Well, we know the economy's improved. We know that unemployment has actually declined, but unfortunately, wage, wage growth has re remained stagnant for a very long time. So when you have stagnant wages and increased housing prices, um, you, you have basically, you're spending more money on your housing or your housing cost to income ratio. It's been pushed upwards to that very uncomfortable spot of spending close to 50% of our income on housing. Uh, and so relative affordability is actually now approaching unhealthy levels on the West Coast. Um, and I just want to show you this because to me it's a little shocking. So it's not a San Diego problem or a Santa Cruz problem or a Monterey Bay problem or a San Francisco problem. This is a West Coast problem coastal California, uh, Oregon, and Washington State. So what you see in all of that red up and down the coast are places where we're paying 
um, too much of our income, over 30 percent of our income on housing costs. Contrast with the Midwest, where I know it's really humid out there, but uh, where it's much cheaper to build and wages and housing prices are much more in balance. So why should we care, uh, besides that it's personally uncomfortable to spend so much uh, money on housing? Uh, well, really, actually, the consequences in my mind are quite dire. We have rising income inequality. We're creating a population of housing haves and housing have-nots. So housing haves are owners who've owned their houses now for quite a while who have substantial wealth due to appreciation. And housing have-nots are the renters who pay more and more of your income for rent, and also new homeowners who are also very strapped uh, to buy houses. Now in San Diego, 70% of our population is priced out of our home ownership market. So we have rising income inequality. Uh, we actually have a decline in gross domestic product. On a worldwide basis, the McKinsey Global Institute has determined that due to the global housing affordability crisis, we've lost 1% of GDP because we don't have that money to spend in the marketplace. Um, so the high housing cost burdens are meaning less money to spend in local economies. And actually, even for those with housing wealth, that wealth is very trapped. You can't take it and deploy it into a business. If you want to move in San Francisco, you take your little pot of wealth out of one house and you put it in another. So wealth also has become very constrained. Um, Third, very important, something we need to talk more about. The housing crisis is creating incredible pressure on our local economies. The jobs housing balance, this idea that you can live near work, is in decline. Our workers are facing longer commutes uh, from cheaper markets, and they're, and they're making, um, they're, they're making those trade-offs. I'm going to live someplace else that's cheaper, but now not only are they going to live there, they're opting to work in cheaper markets. So workers are now working below their skill sets to have a better quality of life. So for low-wage workers, uh, what we're seeing is actually worker scarcity in tourism and agriculture. And I think that's true here. It's something I see in my work in Napa County. In higher skill, higher paying workers, they're, making f they're, f they're fleeing the high cost cities. Um, so not only do we have pressure on the local economies, but we have that same pressure on employers who can't attract and retain the workforces that they need. Um, so my last slide. So what are the levers and strategies we have to change this trajectory? And again, I'm going to go over these details in the question and answers, but really five big areas. We must increase production. We must build our way out of this crisis. In California, the, the conversation today is a million to a million and a half more homes. Where we can, we've got to preserve affordability. We're now looking at buying up B and C B and C quality affordable housing and just putting it in trust and holding it so it'll be there for the future. We've got to find ways to lower production costs. And again, I'll talk about that in more detail. We need to um, embrace innovation in housing types and construction technologies. I'm sure you all know what this is, at least if you've seen old movies, you know, the phone, that thing that used to, you used to hold here. And now the phone is something that you hold here, or maybe you talk into your microphone. But think about telephone technology or car technology to the Tesla. We've had none of that innovation in construction technology as it relates to building housing. So we've got a long way to go in terms of bringing down that cost. And the last and the hardest and the most important is we've got to cultivate leadership around these issues of understanding the link of housing to, to income inequality and to uh, gross domestic product and to economic well-being. And then we have to take responsibility to have those hard dialogues with our constituents so that we can uh, get our local electeds, which is where decisions get made, to actually allow us to build more in communities across California. Thank you.
thank you, President Ochoa, for uh, having this event on uh, this very important topic of uh, housing the region's workforce in a manner that is sustainable, affordable, and also provides for a high quality of life, both for families, students, and the economy. It is very encouraging to see Cal State Monterey Bay take such an active role in uh, facilitating uh, this region's important conversation on, on these issues. And I have to say, I am really uh, delighted to be here with this uh, great panel, and also all of you, because you are all you know, smart people who are here because you care. And I think you can put aside some level of ideology and politics to come together to learn from each other, to think about these issues and how uh, we move uh, this region forward, how we move California forward. And my most recent job, as uh, you heard the president uh, talk about, was with the Obama administration in Washington, D.C. And I can tell you that that spirit of putting politics and ideology aside to really work hard on important issues was in very short supply. So uh, it is great to be here uh, in an environment where I think there is great spirit of cooperation and thinking through together uh, how we work on uh, what are difficult challenges, but also I think some opportunities. Now that's not to say my comments about Washington DC, that is not to say I am not uh, grateful for the experience that I had working for the Obama administration. It was a wonderful uh, experience and I feel good about what we were able to accomplish uh, during my time in the administration, which was almost six years. Uh, and especially when you think about the fact that um, I came in in early 2009 to an environment of the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, and one precipitated no less by the housing market and lack of regulation around that housing market and failed uh, regulation around that housing market. So when you think about being in the housing policy and housing administration world and coming into an environment where essentially the economy of the country and the world was tanked uh, by the housing market, uh, you know you've got a job to do and, uh, you know, you, you've got to just get in there and roll up your sleeves and do whatever you, whatever you can uh, to make a difference. And I would say I feel like uh, this administration did a phenomenal job of stabilizing the economy, uh, leading to stabilizing of the housing market, and frankly, uh, setting the stage for some of the challenges uh, that we're now having today because the economy uh, is, is coming back. And the one thing I do want to say about uh, the work that was done uh, during uh, these past years of the crisis and recovery on the housing market is I believe that when history is written, the single most important thing in the housing market that uh, will have been done is the creation of something called the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And this is a bureau that you know is independent and really helps consumers understand and also particularly around mortgages and financial products, uh, what they are getting into. And it also sets out guardrails for lenders uh, around the kinds of products they can offer uh, to people. And I think in the long run, that is what is really going to make a huge difference in terms of a safer housing market for, for all Americans. And um, I hope uh, that as a result of uh, that kind of regulation, we won't see uh, the devastation and foreclosure crisis that uh, we saw uh, ever, ever again in this country. Now, uh, I th why am I here then? Why am I not still in the administration? Uh, and I, I have to say it got to a point where I felt like I and my colleagues have essentially done everything that we could do um, within the constraints of the existing politics and situation, particularly as we're going into uh, this election type cycle. And it was time for me to step back and actually not be in the middle of a crisis every day, 
some of them manufactured in Washington, some of them real. Uh, but so to be able to spend time on important uh, policy changes and work and not just uh, trying to keep the government open uh, because we have people fighting in Congress. So I uh, am delighted to be uh, back uh, in California where I spent most of my career uh, developing uh, mixed income, mixed use, affordable housing developments up and down the state of California. So very uh, familiar with all of the tools at our disposal to try to make a dent um, in, in this problem. Um, but I really wanted to take a step back and think and frankly learn from some very smart students at, at Berkeley about um, other ways we can think about moving the housing uh, market forward uh, in, in a positive direction so that we can have housing and homes that are both affordable to the broad workforce that are done in a way that can meet the state's ambitious climate change goals um, and in a way that provide real opportunities for uh, families uh, in this country. And when I talk about opportunity, it, it is impossible to talk about without the context of uh, race and inequality that many of the policies in the history of this country around housing have simply uh, had in place, which make it harder for minority families to own and build the kind of wealth uh, that uh, Jennifer was talking about uh, in, in her slides. And so, um, to me, the importance of the intersection of affordability of climate change goals and what I would call the fair housing landscape are uh, what I really want to spend some of my uh, intellectual time thinking about and moving forward. So. Uh, today, I'm going to really talk about one particular idea I have, uh, but before I do that, I'm going to show you just a couple of framing slides, and I do know that you've heard uh, a number of these things from Jennifer and Owen, uh, and sometimes if you hear it you know, more than once, you know, it, it sinks in. That's, uh, that's what they, they teach you. Uh, but here's just a really great, I think, visualization of what the problem is, right? Incomes went down during the crisis. They're coming back up slowly. But look at rents, and you could substitute that you know, purple line for home prices. Rents and home prices are simply outpacing uh, people's ability uh, to afford uh, those homes. And uh, Owen mentioned the legislative analyst report. Uh, one of the things he didn't mention that the state, when they looked at um, this issue in, in coastal California and all of California, if California, you go back to the 1960s, and California was probably, coastal California in particular, was probably always a little bit more expensive than other parts of the country. And then, the, it, it, then in the Midwest, uh, it's a desirable place to live. It's got some geographic constraints. But it was maybe 30% more expensive in the 1960s. Um, it is now like 200% more expensive. Uh, and if we had continued to build the way we were building in the 1960s, it, it might be 60 or 70% more expensive. So somewhat more expensive, but not outrageously more expensive. So I couldn't agree more with uh, my colleagues here that building more is, is important. And that goes to this slide. So our population growth, this starts uh, back in 2005. Uh, you know, the green line is population growth in California. Uh, the light blue line is single family permits. The dark blue line is multifamily permits. And by the way, anybody in real estate development knows that just because you got a permit doesn't mean it actually got built. So the numbers in terms of what actually got built in any one of these years um, is you know, not even as good as what looks at uh, what this chart looks like. So what you see is, you know, we're in a good year, tw 2014, building 85,000 uh, new homes and apartments, but, you know, we need significantly more to keep up with our uh, population growth. And that's one of the reasons that house prices and rents uh, continue to escalate. Incomes aren't keeping up and production isn't keeping up. So those are things that my colleagues covered in some way as well. I want to add one new element which helps frame the idea that I want to talk a little bit uh, more about. And that is this, that in the United States, and I'll get to a slide for California and Monterey as well, all growth in occupied housing units since 2006 has, one, been in the rental stock, 
and two, significantly in the single family rental stock. So in 2006, you had 11.3 million single family renter occupied homes, and that went up 34 percent by 2014. So there's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, and I won't go into all of them, I can certainly talk about it in, in Q&A, but just you know, quickly, there's demographics. We have a younger millennial population. They're marrying later, you're marrying later, you're having children later than your, uh, your parents, and so you are more likely to rent than to own uh, longer, for a longer period of time. So demographics is driving more need for rental housing. Then you have the hangover, a very still serious hangover, of all those people who had their homes uh, foreclosed on during the crisis. Where are they living? They're living in rental housing, and they're primarily living in single-family homes, but they're renting them instead of owning them. So there are a number of factors like that that contribute uh, to this. Uh, California, same picture. Uh, you know, numbers are slightly different, but 30% uh, growth in single-family rental, 9% uh, growth in, or 9.5% growth in multifamily rental. So, so very similar picture. Monterey, uh, pretty much the same, not as much growth, uh, but you can still see, and, and I'm going to get back to Monterey uh, at the end here, but you have a negative, uh, you, you've lost people, occupying single-family homes as homeowners, and you've gained by uh, almost 19 percent single-family uh, people who are renting those, renting homes. And of course, you've had some increase in renter and occupied, renter occupied uh, multifamily uh, dwellings as well. So uh, it's changing a little bit. That those, those numbers were for 2006 through 2014. This chart really just shows you the past year. So what's, you know, what's the progress of change over the past year? And what you see is you're starting to see a few more single family owner occupied homes, but still tremendously outpacing that is single family renter occupied uh, homes. And the last slide, which I'll leave up here as I talk about my idea, uh, has three lines. The United States in blue, so starting in 2005, you know, 19, I'm sorry, 13 percent of homes were single family detached homes were rented. It's now up to 17 percent. In California, it's gone from 19 percent to 24 percent. Monterey, what I found interesting, and it goes to some of Owen's slides, maybe because it's a very single family dominant uh, landscape, is even back in 2005, you were at 24 uh, percent single-family rentals in, Mon in Monterey. And this is the three uh, counties combined, I believe. And then, uh, interestingly, went really up in 2011 and 2012. I don't know what that little bump was about. I can't explain it. Uh, but it's still on that trajectory of single-family rental homes being uh, quite a robust part of the market uh, in this area. So I have been on this uh, thought process, and I have still a lot of idea development that I uh, need to, to, to do. And so you can throw tomatoes at me during Q&A and tell me I'm crazy to think about these ideas or give me good constructive uh, suggestions about these ideas. But my idea at a high level is that in addition to adding to the supply in multifamily, uh, in doing mixed use, mixed income developments, we need to think about how we intensify single family lots and single family homes. And there's a lot of reasons I say intensify. It's not just adding density, it's also intensifying the use of uh, single family lots and the interior of single family homes to make more room for the people who need to live in our region and uh, need to be close to their jobs and need to be in high quality schools and service amenity um, 
environments. And so under that idea of intensifying single family lots and uh, neighborhoods, I have four uh, kind of ideas I just want to throw out there. Uh, one, and you, this is kind of like there's no new idea under the sun. This idea has been around since the 1970s probably, but it's scaling what we call accessory dwelling units. So accessory dwelling units are those little cottages that are uh, behind many single family homes. And you might think of this as very Berkeley or maybe very Santa Cruz, because I know Santa Cruz is pretty uh, enlightened in terms of their zoning around allowing accessory dwelling units. In fact, uh, just a quick sidebar, my first home ownership was in a uh, tenants in common, it's called. I lived in a delightful one bedroom cottage uh, about six years out of uh, college and working. I took my money I was saving in my pension fund account and I put a down payment on this house with two friends who owned the front, who had just gotten married, who owned the front big house, and I owned uh, the little cottage in the back. It's not an impossible kind of idea to encourage uh, both more home ownership but also uh, encourage intensifying these single family uh, neighborhoods. And the way you do that is you have model ordinances that uh, don't require as much parking um, and allow for these kind of accessory dwelling units. Uh, and many communities have gotten on the bandwagon now uh, and are writing new model ordinances that are really encouraging uh, this kind of accessory dwelling unit to happen. Now many people, and I think when Owen, uh, we were on the phone uh, talking about uh, this panel, a lot of people say, you know, that's very boutique. It's not going to get us very, uh, very far. And I think if you just change accessory dwelling unit ordinances, that's absolutely true. But I think there are additional incentives that we should be thinking about. How can we help homeowners who own single family homes be incentivized to add to their lots? And one way is through helping them actually do that. And again, Jennifer's idea of use of technology, uh, you know, you can go to Thumbtack and all these websites, you know, that help you design your interior of your home. And there are now some that are popping up that could actually help you as a homeowner figure out how to navigate the permit process, add a, add a unit onto the back of your house. And I think that will help. But the other area uh, for accessory dwelling units I think will really make a difference is to provide local tax incentives and uh, state tax incentives. Why don't we exempt, you know, the property tax, you know, increase for the improvement of that uh, dwelling unit in the back, for example? We, we could do that. Uh, we could have property tax exemption uh, for that new unit. And, and there are other incentives like that that I think if we do that, we could scale up that idea. One other idea in this bucket of intensifying uh, single family lots and neighborhoods is single family rental and scaling that from a more mission driven perspective. And when I say mission driven, I mean let's have uh, a nonprofit or organizations like that who are committed to owning many scattered sites, single family rentals, and then perhaps also having a program, and I have some financial ideas about how to make this work, um, that could help that renter that they rent to actually ultimately be able to own that home. And what is holding back uh, that kind of strategy, because you look at the slide, you've got a lot of single family renters out there in homes. What's holding back that what I call lease to own strategy is a financing product that is needed for these, say, nonprofits who would own these 50 homes uh, to be able to uh, have a loan against all those 50 houses, but be able to spin out one by one uh, to a, a tenant after they meet certain credit qualifications to actually be able to, to buy that home. So I've got some ideas uh, around that that I'm exploring that I think could get uh, that strategy and that lease to own strategy uh, to scale. And the last idea I would mention is literally, and I'm stealing this idea uh, th from um, a great source, which is a nonprofit organization in Marin County uh, that is really looking at how you reconfigure single family homes 
to have privacy, uh, and, but, re but rent to more people as a homeowner. And I'm giving, going to give you the example uh, that the woman who founded this nonprofit called Lilypad uh, gave me. She was a divorced architect in Marin County, California, living in a very nice single family home. The only way she could afford to stay in that home after her divorce was uh, to, to rent it. So she reconfigured the master bedroom into essentially a studio. No added square footage. She just reconfigured the master bedroom into a uh, separate unit that she then rented out. And that was 15 years ago. Her children are now gone. She has now moved into the um, what was essentially a studio apartment and is now renting out the balance of her house. That's the kind of ideas that we need to make room in this country uh, for more people, again, who can uh, live close to their jobs, get off the road, and uh, be part of the fabric of a community, be in good school districts, and have opportunities. So I think these are really important strategies. I believe they can be scaled, uh, and people will adopt them. This is kind of you know, disruptive technology. Uh, this is Uber instead of taxi. Uh, you've got to think different, as they say at Apple. And uh, so I encourage you to uh, try to help, help me get my head around ideas like this uh, that can make a difference to, um, to our environment and to our families. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your presentations. Very stimulating and thought-provoking. And we're going to get started here with some questions to get the conversation going as we collect questions from the audience. Uh, let me start with uh, something that's been on our minds for some time now, and that's the drought. Um, how, in your view, how does the state's drought um, affect the issue of affordable housing uh, and generally, the water supply concerns for in California. Owen, you want to take that one first? <laughs> you give me the hard one. Yeah. Um, I, I think that generally um, the idea that n new development is uh, a factor in water consumption is a little bit... Um, misplaced. A lot of, most new development per capita uses a lot less water than existing development. I think generally um, we have a water supply problem that has to get solved. I'm not sure it's connected to in any way to new development. And that is, whether we build anything or not, there are a lot of communities that need to solve their water supply problem. And so I understand, you know, reflexively why, and this came up in Santa Cruz very recently around the discussion of a desalinization plant. And I think people finally got the idea that a moratorium on connections or any of that was not a solution to the water supply problem. So I think as um, radical as it may sound, I, I think I would disconnect the discussion around affordable housing and, wa and water. I'm not sure they're directly connected. Hmm. Any thoughts? I just want to add one thought uh, because listening uh, just triggered this uh, conversation I had standing in the bathroom with my husband uh, and he was leaving the water running <coughs> uh, while he was brushing his teeth and I was like, you know, you need to turn the water off. You need to, we need to save water, right? And he's like, look, you know, it's all those farmers out there that are taking all the water, <laughs> and why should I do anything about it? And I turned to him and I said, if you had had that attitude when you were a young environmentalist in the 1970s, we'd still be using styrofoam cups. And, you know, we wouldn't have solved, uh, you know, that particular problem, which we did by, uh, you know, really taking individual action. So I, I think, like Owen, that it's not the new development per se, it's all of us uh, doing everything we can to conserve uh, the precious water that we have and be sure that we're, as we're doing new development, there are all kinds of things that are being done from re recycled landscaping and 
uh, wa uh, recycled water for landscaping and all those activities that we should continue to uh, promote. Very good. Um, this came up uh, in one of your presentations, but let me revisit this question. Um, are there enough incentives for cities and other local governments to develop affordable housing currently, or do we need more, and what types? Let's drill down a little bit more on that question. Well, I'll start, um, because I, 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 I like to say that the first um, actions we take should never be about money. Uh, the, first, the first kinds of actions we take when we look at social problems should be, um, are, are there things that we can do better and more efficiently? It's too easy to jump to money first. Um, and, and I will say that absolutely to produce affordable housing or below market rate housing takes a subsidy. Uh, but to say that we always need capital is, is to simplify the answer. One of the things that we did in San Diego with great success was we traded um, development rights for affordable housing. So we traded density or floor area ratio for affordable ownership, affordable home ownership and affordable rental opportunities. And in, a, in an era of government uh, dollar scarcity, we need to be thinking out of the box. Um, we're doing a little work, to be honest, in Panama, where the local government doesn't have any money, the state has it all, and we've been talking about how do you use development incentives to drive um, production. So I always think we should start with the non-monetary um, solutions, um, but to get to the number of units that we need in California and to actually serve the very lowest income population, you never can do that within the marketplace, no matter how many good things you do, no matter how many levers that you change. And so for that, we'll always need, uh, we'll always need um, governmental assistance, either rental assistance or capital dollars. And it's important, again, just to have work, um, the, work, the workers that we need in our economy and to keep the workers that we have, not having to make um, long commutes, that we continue to build a steady supply of low-income housing. And for that, we'll always need government money. Can, can I add one uh, thought to that, which is, <clears throat> when you talk about incentives, in, in some ways what I think is the, and maybe it goes to your leadership point, but one of the most important things I think that local governments need is is cover, political cover, mm -hmm. to actually approve development activities. And Jennifer was talking about what a, uh, a NIMBY is. Uh, the latest joke I heard was, you know, what's the definition of an environmentalist? The person who bought their house yesterday. <laughs> uh, nobody <laughs> has an incentive, once you own your little piece of the American dream to allow anybody else to build theirs. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, there's no built-in incentive for that. And so I think finding ways that uh, we can, see, these are hard political votes. Uh, I don't know if anybody saw the HBO series, Show Me a Hero, uh, but you should, you should watch it. It's about the desegregation of Yonkers and the, the courts coming into Yonkers and saying, you must approve this affordable housing uh, or you're gonna be held in contempt of court. And you know, it was it, only the 1990s. This wasn't something that was happening back in like the civil rights you know, movement era. It was, it's, it's shocking, but I'm looking at that show and again, I turn to my husband and he says, is it really like that out there? And I'm like, you betcha. Uh, I spent a lot of my life in front of city councils trying to get developments approved, and these are tough votes for politicians, uh, and we have to make it easier for them, and there's a lot of ways that that can be done. Thanks. Um, we've got some interesting um, uh, cards here that are more in the way of comments than questions, but they're provocative comments, so I'm gonna turn them loose on you and see what you think about this. Uh, we have here one that reads, in San Francisco, we've seen a rapid influx of Silicon Valley high-income earners. This is fueled by the profit motive. However, this is leading to a pushing out of low-income residents. This trend is also happening in Santa Cruz. What can we do to stop this trend from reaching Monterey County? We already have income inequality, but this will only worsen an already terrible situation. <laughs> You're looking at me. <laughs> um, well, it's interesting. I, I, as my slide indicated, there's been so little 
housing built uh, in Santa Cruz for a long time that I think we could use a little more housing. And then, and yeah, it has to be market-based and, and, and we have a window of opportunity to build some market rate housing. There, in my discussions with developers, everybody is concerned about affordable housing and everybody is searching for ways. Everybody recognizes that we, uh, we, we risk this economy from San Francisco to here if we don't find a way to build more affordable housing. And, I th I, and, and every developer I talk to wants to be part of that solution and find ways to allow uh, an economic model that allows them to build more affordable housing. I mean, um, the discussion in San Francisco around adding additional height for affordable units is, I think, you know, cutting edge. We, we're going to need to find ways to incentivize affordable housing alongside market rate housing. It's really the only solution that I can think of to build a significant amount of housing. And, um, and in a sense, leveraging uh, high wage jobs to create more affordable housing. Uh, the way I look at it is uh, market rate housing is the cows and the affordable housing is the milk. And if you don't have any cows, you don't have any milk. So there's a, um, I, you know, I, I think some people think we don't have enough land to build the housing that we need. Um, Carol and I were looking at some diagrams of density uh, in cities throughout California and the United States and in the world. Even cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles are actually pretty low density on a per capita <laughs> basis. And um, one of the, the ways to make sure that we have the housing that we need, it, and it's getting a lot of, of write-up, is this concept of unlocking land. Um, in New York, Mayor Bloomberg actually wanted to tax people more who are sitting on their land than leaving it idle. In San Francisco, there's a proposition right now, I want to say Prop K, to put all public land uh, to the purpose of building affordable housing. Um, Carol is talking about densifying, almost doubling the density of single family lots by putting just one more unit on them. Um, so th there is not a scarcity of land, there is plenty of land and so in order to lower the cost of housing and to make more housing available, we've got to, we've got to have that conversation about using land. And again, it's, it's a hard conversation I think because um, what we have is we, we are, the, the prosperity of the generations that, that come after us is really at risk because we aren't going to be able to have that, those generations, which are your generations who are students, be able to have the job you want and live in the place you want to live if we can't put, get the income uh, and, and housing price uh, more on balance. And so the easiest way, again, to do that is build. We've got to build. We've got to have more supply. Um, and so that it's, a, it's really, it's the, the scarcity of land is something that's not true and everybody needs to know it. And again, we need to have those hard conversations and unfortunately, they happen actually at the local government level in small city councils in small cities like all of the cities here. And you have this pushback of homeowners um, and people who are afraid of how life may change or that there may be more traffic. And, and you have that group uh, fighting to preserve a way of life for which their offspring and our offspring and, and all of you, uh, it's not a lifestyle that, that, that we're going to be able to live in the future. And again, that's that leadership question um, of how we all become leaders at the city council to ask for a future for California that's going to sustain us all. Well, one quick add, which is the number one concern of Silicon Valley CEOs is the cost of housing uh, because they're, con they're concerned as well because they're, they're own employees and they, they know that the regional employees, you know, for every high tech job, they're actually generating, you know, five low wage jobs too. Th those companies um, are going to end up moving to Austin and to Colorado and to other places and it's already starting to happen. Uh, so they are as vested in seeing that housing affordability and housing supply 
uh, happens because they, they want to stay here. It's a knowledge, you know, there's knowledge, all these universities with smart people, you know, they, they want to tap into that workforce and, and the lifestyle here, but uh, they, they are con very concerned uh, that housing issues are, are going to weigh them down. So um, I, th I think I alluded to this at the beginning, um, that there is this connection and it can be virtuous or vicious between jobs and housing. And so one of our uh, members of our audience is, is pointing out that affordability it really is a function of two variables. One is the price of the house, and the other one is the income level. So um, the question then is, what, how, how much of a role should economic development strategies geared toward generating better paying jobs play in this process of making housing affordable? So I think it's a, uh, there's a great example in Santa Cruz where uh, businesses want to locate in Santa Cruz and literally can, their employees cannot find housing. Even well-paid employees at this point can't find housing in Santa Cruz. Their uh, one uh, um, 100 employee company is actually renting hotel rooms for the employees to stay during the week. The point I'm making is that we, I think what we've begun to see, at least in this region, is that the lack of housing is what's impeding uh, the ability to attract higher wage jobs. And frankly, the housing market allows, attracts capital that allow you to build the housing um, first. And <laughs> it's funny, the, the concept of housing first, my view is that's the first step in really increasing the wages because to increase the wages, you're going to need employers that pay higher wages. So once you, so increasing the housing stock is part and parcel of a, of a complete economic strategy to increase the opportunity for higher wage jobs. I don't think I don't think you can. Um, I mean, you certainly can, as as Owen has done. You can disconnect them. In San Diego, the vacancy rate's three percent. So it it almost doesn't matter how much money you make. There's such a constrained supply. <coughs> but as our communities urbanize more and more, you need more money to live in an urban environment. And absolutely, we need strategies in California where life has become more expensive that put our students and our young adults on, on uh, career pathways to sustainable wages, to middle income jobs. And, um, and so even as we're trying to, to prevent the cost of housing from getting higher, we still need strategies to bring incomes up. And especially in areas that are urbanizing, uh, we, we need incomes to be higher and higher, more jobs and middle class jobs so that people can afford to live, live in urban environments. Mm -hmm. There's another question that, again, broadens the discussion a little bit, but uh, we've identified NIMBYism as a problem, and that tends to run across generational lines. As you said, an environmentalist is the person that already got their house built. Um, and so um, how can we, have you, any, do you have any thoughts on how we can create the mindset that uh, gets people, uh, older residents to think about the problem as a, a common problem, a, sh a shared problem that we need to resolve. What, I have some ideas, but I'd like to hear yours ideas about that. I want to hear your ideas about <laughs> that. Uh, so, you know, I, I think this is, uh, it's a great, great question. And I happen to be on the board of an organization called Enterprise Community Partners that has started a public awareness campaign uh, that's called Make Room. And they do these little videos, and they're getting them out to the press. And I think personalizing um, the challenges uh, at the individual uh, level. And if you think about some of the movements uh, that we've had in this country on social, big social change, uh, it is because uh, you know people actually got to know a person uh, who was gay. They got, they had a son, they had a daughter, right? That changed the conversation. You know, same thing with the civil rights uh, movement. Some of these um, just personalizing the challenges for individuals uh, 
at a high level, I, I think can make a big difference. We haven't had you know, the ability, you know, financially or whatever, uh, we haven't had that movement evolve, but finding ways to, to get that movement to evolve, um, I think would make a difference. Mm -hmm. What are your ideas? Well, actually, I think your idea is better. Because uh, <laughs> you're right, I think people basically respond emotionally and then can find their way to a rational basis for that first decision that's made emotionally. So I, my, my approach was more rational, which is probably less compelling, but just to point out the fact that uh, the young people of today are the ones that, are, that you need to see gainfully employed and paying your into the Social Security Fund, the ones that are going to have to buy your house you know, when you're ready to sell it, et cetera. That, so in that sense, we're all connected mm -hmm. uh, in, in, the, in the regional economy. So that's an argument. But I guess to, to really feel that, I, I would agree with you that personalizing it is what works. You know, uh, I, I, I was thinking about this actually this morning. So when we think about NIMBYism, so many uh, issues we think about as, as, income, uh, as income issues, you know, that, that poor people do this or wealthy people do this. And NIMBYism is actually one of those issues that, that uh, crosses economic strata but is actually very focused. It's a very much, as you say, President Ochoa, it's a generational issue. So it's actually NIMBYism is strongest in, in our older populations. And I was going to say the same thing that Carol said. It's really about telling stories. And it's trying to help everybody understand that we want to have our children and our grandchildren be able to live in the communities that we live in and to, grow, to come back and work in the communities in which they were raised. And demographically, what we know is that in non-Caucasian communities where family ties are, are, are even closer and this idea that your daughter or son might go and live on the other side of the country is less prevalent, that in, in communities of color, families have a stronger preference to even stay in, in almost in neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And so telling this story that your son or your granddaughter isn't gonna be able to live in this community is an important story to tell um, uh, as these discussions are having. Mm. Um, another comment here that uh, is, you know, looks for your reaction. I'm concerned that most of the recommendations address growth, but there was little discussion of the quality of the growth and of the development of high-density, walkable, livable communities. It seems that the conversation needs to expand its scope a bit to go to, uh, to think beyond just a single family home and to the community. I couldn't agree more. I think, and that actually gets back to the previous discussion, I think NIMBYism is rooted in fear, in fear of change, and fear of, of not a quality environment. And um, one of the exciting things that's really happened, particularly in this last growth cycle, is that uh, while we've been talking about infill and densification in California for many years, I th both young and old are, are are speaking with their wallets that they want to live in an urban environment, they want a walkable environment, they want a place that they can um, go shopping, entertain without driving. And while this was a theory, I think, for many years, I think th th it's actually become a reality because people, both young and old, want that. And I think that's a story that does cut, a cut across um, young and old, and um, and it's been borne out. If you know in urban development, the discussion in the marketplaces of the urban barbell, where you have young and old living side by side, tend to be, at this point be less families. But the point is, that's an environment that everybody is drawn to once it's done effectively, and it's 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 an exciting opportunity. And um, I think communities that uh, you know, can support that and embrace that, I think they're that ultimately w w will be rewarded politically as well as financially because I think people want those kind of environments. They want to be in those, those settings. And can, can I just say, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and my pitch on the single family intensification is not, sh should not be any way viewed as an alternative to this uh, uh, kind of uh, development, but uh, 
you know, we have something like 60% or 70% of the housing stock that are in single family neighborhoods. My point is they're not going anywhere. Right. They're, you know, they're valuable pieces of property. They're not gonna be torn down to, to build mm -hmm. new higher density on that. There's plenty of, I mean, just driving around the campus with uh, Andre today, I mean, th there's plenty of room to add on land and we should absolutely do that in a uh, appropriate uh, way, but let's not forget that we have a lot of great single-family neighborhoods near transit, near you know uh, good transportation corridors, and finding ways to also intensify those neighborhoods is just an added strategy. You know, uh, what we know about new housing is that it's getting smaller, which is appropriate. I mean, we've ballooned from houses in the U.S. of 1,500 square feet to 2,500 and 3,500 square feet. And now we, we know that housing is in the urban areas is starting to get smaller. And again, we had a great tour uh, uh, of housing, uh, many decades of housing before we were here. But I think two examples that you all know, uh, we got to go through the new student dorms. Uh, that's a phenomenal example of, of great design. Uh, I imagine those units are pretty small up, up top that you're sharing bedrooms, but lots of great common space, pool tables, movie room, nice outdoor areas. And that, that same kind of housing is the housing that we want to see in many urban communities, just four stories, but pretty dense, highly amenitized. And then you've got some new home ownership housing going on in here as well, pretty small lots. Uh, very little grass. The, the goal is 10% of the lot these days or less has got grass, uh, but wonderful design with, with front porches. Um, again, but houses that were 13 to 1600 square feet for a single family home. So design is critical to making density uh, appeal to appeal, uh, appealing to all of us. And design is also important as we, as we move from less private space and more public space. Uh, so that we all still have the benefits that we want. So uh, there's um, something called Section 8 hardware vouchers. And um, sometimes uh, landlords won't accept them. Uh, what are the issues associated with this? I mean, is this tool a viable one? Can it be made to work better? Or, or is it something that's seen its day? Well, I, I'll just start and, and um, I'll let others finish. So there's no law that prohibits discrimination against people who have sec Section 8 vouchers. And so um, that makes it very tough in, in high markets to get landlords to accept those. Um, and it's just that's just an incredible barrier that I don't know um, that anybody who's a private owner I is, is going to want to have changed because just like if I own housing, I can rent to anybody I want. Uh, that means somebody with a Section 8 certificate or somebody with a dog or somebody with no pet. It's a, it's a pretty tough issue to think about tackling, um, mm -hmm. but it's definitely a, a, a barrier. I, I would say there, there are, it is a barrier, and there are uh, a number of them. One is that the rent level that the federal government, you know, kind of uh, trickles down to the landlord uh, for acceptance of that voucher is based on, I'm not going to get the, this exactly right, but the 40th percentile of the median average, you know, home uh, or rental. So it, 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 it's a depressed number. Um, and so it's not always enough, you know, for a, a landlord to want to accept that when you've got a hot housing market and he or she can uh, get people who will pay a lot more than the, what they will get from the voucher. So that's a barrier. And there's the red tape of dealing with the government agency that's going to inspect your unit. And th so there, there's complications around that. I don't think it's a program that is going away uh, because I think it's still very important and people are finding places to use those those vouchers. Uh, but I do think there are some other ideas that we should, at the federal level, be thinking about to make that kind of uh, subsidy work better for the landlord and a, and a tenant, maybe make it more transparent. And then I, I would say there are some communities that I believe, and 
uh, I'm a little out on the limb here, but uh, there are some communities that have made it uh, illegal to discriminate on source of income. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know that is a strategy, and, and I'm not sure that's a local or uh, a state issue, but I've heard that as a strategy before. Mm -hmm. Okay, now here's a question that, that will, be, will resonate with many in our audience. How is a growing student debt load influencing housing affordability? Mm -hmm. What should we be doing about that? So I just spent a day at the Anderson School, which is the business school at UCLA, and uh, I, I was invited to an affordable housing conference, and little did I know it was going to be full of researchers from the, you know, Office of the, of the Treasury and the Federal Home Loan Bank, and, and I'm not an academic, um, and, and they went into great detail about regression analysis on all kinds of things, but this was one of them. So clearly, uh, one of the things that's kept the millennials at home uh, was not being able to get jobs during the recession, but the amount of student debt is also keeping millennials home and also um, delaying household formation, marriage, uh, childbearing, and all of those things. So. Um, we've, we've got to figure out how to to get those costs down, and there's a lot of talk at the federal level about how to lower um, educational costs. There's been some great action, if you don't know it. I, uh, the middle class scholarship laws in California, making um, scholarships now available to the middle class as well. Um, but we've, yeah, we've definitely got to tackle that issue if, if we're going to get the, this generation launched on, and out of their parents' homes and into their own. One other uh, question um, that we should address is the question of urban growth boundaries. I mean, that's part of the landscape, but is it part of the problem? Is it part of a solution? <laughs> what role does it play? Um, I believe that urban growth boundaries are really important, and, and I, for one, am glad that they've been established, particularly in this area. My concern has always been a corresponding desire well, I shouldn't say desire, corresponding need to, f to find um, uh, enough housing inventory within urban limit lines. Um, other areas like Portland, when they establish urban limit line, establish it with a, a natural inventory of land. And I think my view is that in this area, we, we saw urban limit lines as a way to stop growth with no concern about a land inventory of housing, and I think that we've, we're living the consequences of that decision. If you, if you set a hard urban limit line, we have some of the most valuable farmland in the country around here, and there's very good reason to do it. We have to have a corresponding policy to increase density within the urban limit. And so I kind of look at it, we got the political cake, which was easy, we want to set a hard, limit line, the political broccoli was the higher density within the urban limits, and there wasn't much interest in eating the, the broccoli that was, that's grown in the fields, ironically, but, <laughs> <laughs> but everybody wanted the cake of the urban limit. Right, yeah, so in fact, what we need is an urban growth boundary that is set in tandem with a target density for what's inside of it, right? So. Yeah. Growth and and more more than a you know, target density, but I think we're getting we're starting to see instead of general guidelines about infill numbers, uh, uh, eventually I think we have to get to where uh, no not only does the land have to be zoned, but and and zoned easily, but cities need to have actual numeric goals of housing units built, mm -hmm. and that's something that um, within and that's because it's been too easy to uh, kind of skate on this gray area and current housing um, uh, element law doesn't require the units get built, it only requires that vaguely the land gets zoned. And so that's an area that I think generally would help somehow you know, spread the need to build housing. So, anyway. so I'm going to um, close now by asking each of you, um, if you in, in now there, I'm giving you the opportunity to ask each other a question. So, has, have listening to each other has have, have any questions prompted it come to the fore that you would want to ask another presenter? That's a good one. Okay. I have a qu question for Carol. 
and you know, given your experience in, in Washington, do you think um, the housing policy since World War II and the, num the amount of w which made me think about this is this discussion around densifying single family neighborhoods, which is so important. Do you think that the housing policy generally in this country has been too encouraging of single family development since World War II? So I would put it this way. Um, I don't think this country has had a development and growth policy as a nation really uh, consciously and articulate it, right? The housing policy has been a safe and livable, suitable living environment for people of all economic segments, but there's been no, I mean, that's 1949 Housing Act. I didn't quote that exactly, but something along those lines. Uh, and yet, both the Federal Housing Administration, which I ran, but not in the 1950s, uh, and the Federal Highway uh, Fund, you know, pushed development, I mean, not pushed, they enabled developers to build huge subdivision, the Levittowns of the world, uh, you know, all across the country by providing both the financing and the infrastructure to make that happen. Um, and uh, it was done as an economic development. It was done to house, you know, the World War II, the veterans coming home from, you know, World War II who were, you know, creating families. And there was no thought about the fact that we were going to run out of land or run out of resources. Uh, and by the way, it was done with racial covenants. Uh, and so only white families could move into those um, homes. So that is our history. That is not a good legacy. Uh, and so, yes, <laughs> to the extent we had a federal housing policy that encouraged it uh, and supported it, you know, we are, you know, we are seeing the negative consequences of that today. Okay, well, we've had a, uh, this has been the most questions I've ever received in any <laughs> of our series. Uh, it's a, a, a testimony of the interest that your presentations have elicited in our audience. So I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And we're going to give you a little memento here of our university. Wow. Ooh, a hoodie. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. And so I want you to please join uh, our speakers uh, in a reception outside. Thank you. Thank you.